before you humbly, and we're here to worship you in this place, God. We dedicate not only this service to you, Lord, this morning, but we dedicate this entire year to you, God. I pray that 2023 would be a year of Jesus. I pray that as we praise you and as we worship you this morning, God, that you would come and you would visit and you would rest in this place this morning, God. I pray that this would be a tabernacle of your glory this morning, God, as we lift you up on high, as we put you back on the throne of our lives, God. I pray that you be lifted high in this place, Lord, and I pray that you be glorified, Lord. All glory, all, gl- all majesty, all power belongs to you, God. And we welcome you into this place this morning. We welcome you into our hearts this year. And I pray that you be glorified. It's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. As you guys can see, my hand is doing better. So if I, if I make some mistakes, it's not 100% there yet. But we're getting there. So would you guys stand? I'm going to need some help from you all this morning. As you can see, the band is full. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lean on you guys a bit this morning. Amen. Our sins are gone, and our 
chains have been lifted, Lord. We thank you for your sacrifice on the cross all those thousands of years ago, Lord, that we could stand before you this morning, healed and whole in you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we desire more of you, God. I pray that we would draw closer to you this morning, Lord. Lord, we welcome you in this place. Are we waiting for this day? We're gathered in your name and calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. Because you're the reason. You're the reason we We want to see you Open up the floodgates A mighty river Flowing from your heart Filling every part of our praise Your presence in this place Your glory on our face We're looking to the sky Descending like a cloud you're standing with us now, Lord, unveil our eyes. Cause you're the reason. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. And open up the heavens, and we want to see you. And open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart. Part of our praise. Sing, open up the heavens, open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every part of our praise. We want to see you, God, fill up our praise. Our hearts cry out. Church, let's sing it. Show us. And show us, and show us your glory. Show us, and show us your power. And show us, and show us your glory, Lord. And show us your glory, Lord. And show us, and show us your glory. And show us. Show us your power and show us and show us your glory, Lord. And show us your glory. Show us and show us your glory. And show us and show us your power. Show us and show us your glory. One more time, show us your glory. And show us, and show us your glory. Show us, and show us your power. And show us, and show us your glory, Lord. Open up the heavens, and we want to see. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. We want to see you open up the heavens. We want to see you open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Fill up our praise, God. God, we want to see you, Lord. Come and open up the heavens, Lord. Let's sing, show us your glory. And show us, and show us your glory. And show us, 
And show us your power. And show us, and show us your glory, Lord. Show us your glory. Show us, and show us your glory. And show us, and show us your power. And show us. Show us your glory, Lord. It's God like Moses on the mountain, Lord. Show us your glory, Lord. Lord, we want to see you. We want to see you in glory. We want to see you in power, God. Come and pour it out in this place this morning, Lord. Lord, let the floodgates open. Let your glory fall. Let your glory fall. Yes, God, that's our prayer. To show us your glory. Show us. Show us your glory, and show us, and show us your power, and show us, and show us your glory, Lord. One more time. Show us, and show us your glory, and show us, and show us your power, and show us. And show us your glory, My 
saving me. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for saving me. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for saving me. Thank you, God, for saving me. called your name you heard my cry out of the grave and into life my heart is yours my soul is free thank you God for saving me thank you God for saving me Thank you, God, for saving me. Thank you, God, for saving me. God, we thank you for your grace, for your mercy, Lord, that you saw into history and future and knew that we would need a Savior. We thank you for sacrificing yourself on that cross, bearing our sin, bearing our shame. What more can we give to you but a song of praise? In our lungs, 
touch your breath in our lungs and so we pour out our praise to you only it's your breath in our lungs and so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs and so we pour out our praise to you only Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. We sing to you, we sing to you. Great. Uh, as we prepare for tithes and offerings this morning, I just remind you, you can give online if you like. Many people like to do that. You can go to DesertCreekFellowship.com. Lower right-hand corner of the homepage, there's a giving button. Um, sometimes people ask me, I say, well, you don't accept uh, PayPal or Venmo or text to tweet or any of that, uh, tweet to, t I, I don't know. There's all sorts of different ways you can give, but all those ways cost money, Right? If we use PayPal, they take 3%. If we use text to give they take 3%. If I use Venmo, they take 3%. I'm not trying to be a jerk, but they can come up with their own money, and I would just like all of our money to go to the Lord's work. So, Zelle is the only real quick text, the, the only real fast way to do it, because they don't take a percentage. So, um, so with that, you can write a check, you can slope. There's millions of options, but I've, I've received a number of questions. It's like, all the stuff you take, why don't you take those? That's why. They, they want their pound of flesh. So with that, if you will turn with me this morning to Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. I dare say most of you can probably quote this without turning there. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, do not be deceived, Paul writes. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. I'd like you to understand that there is no exception to that rule. It always works that way. Now, if you'll just turn back a few pages to Acts chapter 4. I'm going to begin in verse 32. I want you to hang with me here. The Dr. Luke is writing. He says, All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who had land or houses sold them, and they brought the money of the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as they had need. Today, I am going to announce a new giving program. I don't know what else to call it. I don't like the word program. I don't care for programs, but I'm going to announce a new giving program. Something we're going to do here in this church. Uh, I have been pondering it for some time with the Lord. I, I, I felt his, his inkling and his, his unction to head down this path. I've just been waiting for the time to be right. And this week I received a phone call and it, it just confirmed to me that the time is right. And so a little background. Some years ago, uh, Bev and I... We're believing God to see our house paid off. Now, that was a big deal, right? For anybody, that's a big deal, you know? We had a 30-year mortgage, and we were believing God to see it paid off. And Bev was the first one to the party. I eventually came on board. 
But when I did, God began to speak to me, and, and I grabbed a hold of this passage out of Galatians, as a man sows, so shall he reap. And I felt like the leading of the Lord was to find somebody whose house was close to being paid off. I, mean, I can't pay my house off, but I might be able to pay somebody else's house off. And we partnered with a couple, and we paid their house off. We couldn't do it in one day, but over a couple of months, we did it. And you know what that produced? My house got paid off in the same year. Okay, now I'm just telling you what happened to us. See, I understand that as a man sows, so shall he reap. I needed to reap a mortgage, and so I sowed a mortgage. I want you to understand this is very scriptural. We, we just read it. I don't mean this to mean legalistic, right? I'm not asking for legalism. But here's what I want to do. We are going to set up a fund at the church that anybody is free to sow into. I'm going to call it the Acts chapter 4 fund. And what's going to happen is, I, well, I, okay, I don't know what's going to happen. What my intention to happen is, those of you who have credit card debt that is mounting and weighing on you, if you will just take, you know, like, like, like they say, you have to pay at least $25 this month. Okay, well, pay your $25 and sow $25. Okay, well, you decide. I'm not trying to make rules. What I am trying to say is if you've got credit card debt, I want you to sow in to this fund. And when this fund gets big enough, what we'll do is we will take nominations and we'll pay off somebody's credit card. And then when that's done, we'll continue the fund and we'll pay off another credit card until all the credit cards are paid off. And then we'll start working on other things. Lord willing, maybe we'll get to mortgages. Now, here's the hard part in this. See, as people, we go, I ain't paying off his. I mean, he doesn't know how to handle his credit cards. I ain't paying off his mortgage. Okay, you don't get to say that. Right? We, none of us are judged by our past. Our past is in the past. What I want you to understand is that when you need to reap something specifically, if you'll sow into that thing, you will likely reap the harvest that you've sown. Some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. So... I also want you to know we're not going to divert tithes and offerings into that fund. So if the fund doesn't work, if it turns out that just nobody wants to give to this fund, then it'll just die right there. It just means we're not ready for that yet. But if it turns out that people sow, and, and again, you don't have to have credit card debt to sow, right? You, you can sow into this when you're completely out of credit card debt. I just want you to know, and you don't have to go crazy when you sow a million dollars into it, right? Just sow your minimum payment into it. Something. Put something in there. And what's happening now is we, as a family, will begin to share one another's burdens. This is scriptural, and it's powerful, and it will, it will pull the rug out from the enemy if we can do it. So, as the funds increase, when it looks like we're close to potentially paying off our credit card, we'll take nominations. You won't be able to nominate yourself. For obvious reasons. But you will be able to say, you know what, I was talking with so-and-so and I think it'd be a real blessing. So we'll take those nominations and then we'll, we'll see who it is that we can help. Jesus said, they will know you by your love. Yes. So, step one is not to take nominations. Step one is to see if the fund will grow. So if you would like to be part of that, and I encourage you to be part of that, especially if you're carrying any credit card debt at all. Um, put your offering in an envelope for this fund. Put it in an envelope and just write Acts 4 on the envelope. Right? If it says Acts 4, then that's where that money is going to end up. And when that builds up, we'll do something cool with it. Yeah, if you send it by Zell, just put Acts 4 on it. If you, if you, however you choose to send it, just so I know, it's to go to the Acts 4 fund. Are we okay with this? Yes. All right, we'll see what the Lord does. Father, I bless your people now in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray over this new adventure we're taking on. 
Father, I pray that you would help us to share in one another's burdens. Father, we, we love one another and we want to carry one another. And I pray, Lord, that you would, you would do something special here. And Father, I pray that it not just end with credit cards, but Father, it be extended to, to cars and, and, and to homes and, and Father, even student loans if necessary. Father, I, I bless the people of this house. Father, I call them the head and not the tail. And, and Lord, where debt still rules in their life, Father, I condemn it in Jesus' name according to your word. Father, I pray that this would be a people of more than enough so that they could be a blessing on every occasion. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, I'm a little excited about this. I don't, I don't know what will happen, but I'm a little bit excited about this. I think it has the potential to be All really right. Cool. Let's turn this morning to Romans chapter 8. Again, this is another passage I think probably all of you are fairly familiar with. Many of you can quote at least parts of it by heart. This morning I'm going to be reading out of the NIV. Um, but I want to give you time to turn there because I'm going to be taking some liberties with it. I want you to be able to see where I'm taking liberties. I'm not changing what's being said. I'm, I want to clarify the hymns and the theys and all that stuff. Paul's writing, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He, that's God, who did not spare his own son, Jesus, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with Jesus, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those who God has chosen. That's you and me. We're the chosen. It's God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ, Jesus, who died and, and more, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and, and even now is interceding. He's praying even now for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it's written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, he says, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I am convinced, he says, that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither heights nor depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Father, I, I ask today that you would help me to convey your word to your people. I pray, Father, you'd help me not to go beyond what's written, but to encourage them and to strengthen them. I pray, Father, that you would speak to their hearts this morning. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as Paul's writing in, uh, in verse 35 and 36, he, he quotes a, a passage. He, he writes this, he says, who shall, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship? or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. And then he says this, As it's written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Okay, now I have to say, as I'm reading this, it's like, not really sure that, you know, typically when you quote a passage, what you want to do is you want to bolster your argument. You want to, you want to, build things up and and this passage is sort of like a ham at a kosher wedding it's just it, it's just a bit out of place I, I don't understand he's not he's not building anything up here for me and what that means is I don't understand what he's trying to say I don't understand what he has said and so that means that I need to dig into it a little bit and so that's what I'll do if you look in your Bible there'll be a reference or if you have an online Bible you'll You'll see a little asterisk or something that you can click on, and it'll take you 
to the passage he's quoting. That passage is Psalm 44, verse 22. And so when he says, as it's written, what he's saying is, as it's written in the Word of God. This is what the Scripture says. Now, if you go over to Psalm 44, what you're going to find is that it is a psalm of the sons of Korah. Right? David, David wasn't the one who wrote this, it was the sons of Korah. And in this psalm, they are speaking about their situation with God. They're crying out before God. And, and essentially, if you take the time to read it, what they're saying is, dude, we ain't done anything wrong. We've been good. And yet, because of you, because of your name, for the sake of you, on account of you, because of you, we are constantly exposed to persecution and death, and we have to endure suffering. They continue, our enemies judge that we are worthy of death. They deem us to be the source of their trouble, the problems that they have in their life, and in fact, they find us to be appropriate subjects to vent their wrath on. So, what Paul is doing is he's using these saints of old, these who followed Christ as a, com or not, a not Christ, who, who followed God, rather, as a comparative example for, uh, for the condition of the saints in his day. What he's saying is, you have the condition of the saints in this period of time. Today, we're suffering the same types of issues. He's, he's showing them. They suffered as you're suffering. Today, we suffer in some ways as they suffer. And it will go on. That's why he's quoting the passage. And the idea that he is conveying through Psalm 44 is even though there was a bit of complaining, they were never separated from God. God never, ever left them. That is his point. And somehow, some way, you need to get this deep inside of you. God will never leave you. And people start thinking of examples right away. It's like, well, there was this time. No, you might walk away from him. That happens a lot. But he will never leave you. He'll never forsake you, regardless of what the circumstances look like. And this, this in large part is the problem. We are a people that tend to look at circumstances. I say, this happened and this happened, and therefore, God has left me. Do you think that's true? It's not. Jesus would make a very similar promise. In Matthew 28, 20, second half, so 28, 20 B, Jesus says this. He says, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Okay, don't we already know all this? I mean, I'd like to think we already knew all this, but, but the truth is, maybe yes, maybe no. C can I ask you a question? The sons of Korah, as they're putting together the 44th Psalm, didn't they already know that? Didn't they know that God would never leave them or never forsake them? You understand the promise, God will never leave you nor forsake you, isn't from Hebrews. I mean, the writer quotes it. That's a, that's a promise from Deuteronomy. Amen. You'll find that in Deuteronomy 31, verse 8. That is really early on the curve, by the way. So they would have known it. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Friends, there's no way they wouldn't have known that. And this brings out a truth that I'm sorry to be the bearer of, sorry to be the one to tell you, in this world, you're going to have some troubles. I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. I, I don't know. Yeah, the thing is, friends, Troubles precede the great victory that follows, and that's what we forget. I whine and I cry like a little child. God left me. I don't know where he's at. I don't know where he brought me here to lead me. And we forget that the victory is at hand. Do you remember when the angel came to Gideon? Gideon's down in this wine press, hiding. 
as he's threshing out wheat. It's a terrible place to thresh out barley or wheat or whatever it was he was threshing out. There's no wind. That isn't going to work. But he's hiding because the Midianites are raiding bands going through the whole land, stealing everything. Okay. In Gideon's time, they had trouble. But God was about to deliver them. Do you remember when David got home from Ziklag? We, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, right? David got back to his home at Ziklag, and the whole place had been burned. Everything was gone. Guess what? That's trouble. And in the case of David, it's almost insult to injury. See, see the, these, these raiding parties, the Amalekites were going through the whole Negev, and they were raiding areas. But David's, David's place, they burned that baby to the ground. They didn't just raid it, they destroyed it. I think, friends, we can learn from these accounts. As I look around today, I, I, I think in some ways we are in almost eerily similar circumstances. It, it seems like there's a lot of raiding parties running around. I take a stand for righteousness, I make a stand with my God. And these raiding parties are popping up all over the place, causing damage, looting, pillaging, burning everything. There's a wake of destruction behind them. And, and I feel like one of the sons of Korah. And I'm asking God, dude, what is up with that? This morning I want you to, to grab a hold of some important principles as we take our stand. And you need to understand these things because the looters and the pillagers and the guys with the fire who are burning everything, they're all over the place. They're popping up all over the place. Here's the first thing I want you to remember in light of all the stuff you see today. We don't walk by sight. As believers, we walk by faith. That means it doesn't matter what the situation looks like. Sometimes it looks really, really bad. I mean really bad. I don't judge by what it looks like. There is no possible scenario where God will leave me or abandon me or walk away from me. Now, that doesn't mean you can't walk away from him, as I already said. And see, what happens is when things look really bad, I get mad at God and I leave. Well, that's not the same thing as him leaving. You have free will. It's just not a wise thing to do. So you can walk away from him, but he'll never leave you. And what this means is, and again, sorry to be the bearer of such tidings, the odds of you skating through this life without trouble or challenge, well, it's just not high. What this does mean, though, is you don't have to go alone. That's what it means. I don't know if you see what's happening in our church. See, as we start to take these little bits and pieces where we start carrying one another's burdens, where we take time to pray for each other, and we check on each other, and we find out what's going on in each other's lives. You know, the Bible says it's good for two, right? When you walk together, when two walk together, if one falls in the pit, the other can lift him out. That's why the word of the Lord has been so strong. Don't leave the boat. Stay with the boat. Because together... No matter what comes, we can work together. But by yourself, things get a little dicey. Jesus said something interesting in Matthew chapter 24, verse 37. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. And I don't think I need to remind you how that worked out, but I will anyway. Noah was told about the times of trouble that were coming. God said, you better build a boat. It's going to get ugly. What I want you to see is God did not take Noah out. God took Noah through. See, and so often the church expects, why isn't God taking us out? His nature is to take us through. Some, sometimes, sometimes, it seems as if the church is, ask, is acting like they're the ones who need the rescue. Now, there was a time when David called on the Lord and said, Rescue me. There's nothing wrong with that. 
But I want you to understand the deeper and the real truth. We're about the only ones, the church, not our church, the church, we're about the only ones equipped to walk through what lies ahead. I hope that doesn't sound arrogant, but, but we're not the ones who need the rescuing. We're the ones who are supposed to be doing the rescuing. We're, we're the ones who are supposed to be bringing the words of eternal life. We're the ones who are supposed to be telling people, not that way, this way. That way is death, this way is life. This is our charge. And that's why Jesus said, I'll be with you even to the end of the age. You understand the end of the age that's after the millennial reign. That's a long, I mean, that's the end of time. Friends, at some point, we need to stop acting like victims and start acting like the conquerors that we really are. Amen. If, if you go back to Ziklag, this is what happened at Ziklag. You just need to understand, look, when, when, when you get home and your house is burned and everything you've got is stolen... You can understand why his men were angry. They were mad. They were frustrated. They felt cheated. And when that happens, all men start looking for blame. We start pointing fingers. Okay, if David hadn't drug us out there, we'd have been home and this wouldn't have happened. When, when dissension comes, dissension is where unity will go to die. You need to watch dissension. You need to keep a close eye on dissension and shut it down when you see it. That's what David did. He, see, David was angry too. All of his stuff had been taken. His wives, kids. But he acted differently in the face of trouble than his men acted. In his time of trial, the Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. Do you know why he encouraged himself in the Lord? Because nobody else would. They were all attacking him. They were all angry. They were all upset. So David went and got alone with God, and he began to, I know God. God doesn't do this type of stuff. God isn't the author of these things. God gave me all this stuff. Why would he take it from me? He began to speak right about God. He began to take on a different perspective, and David knew he was a mighty warrior. Man, David was death on wheels. That guy was just a, he was one bad dude. And he was hanging out with a lot of really bad dudes. Now, I don't mean evil. I just mean, I mean, they could take care of themselves. They, they, were, they were okay in a fight, is what I'm trying to say. Truth is, friends, they were absolutely unstoppable. They were a force of desolation to be reckoned with. And so David, instead of joining them in the whining, he rallies them. Guys, the Amalekites were no match for David and his army. They weren't, they, weren't, they weren't even a distant hope. Once his army found unity, they were a force that could not be stopped. The truth is, the Amalekites had absolutely no hope when David's army came up on them. They just lay down now because you're dead. Okay, but remember, it's true. At Ziklag, David suffered loss. There was looting, there was pillaging, there was burning. Things had not gone David's way. But David wasn't your average guy. See, David was more than a conqueror. The Milikites, it was just, they just made a mistake. It was an ill-advised choice, right? I mean, out of all the people they could have burned, that was just the wrong guy. David would go after them. He would recover everything they took. And he would take everything they had. He pillaged them. That's more than a conqueror. Okay, I don't walk by sight. I walk by faith. And I walk by the faith of what God says about me. And if things look like they're going south, I just buckle up because there's a great victory that lies ahead. Second thing I want you to remember. Man, I'm out of time and we're on two. Second thing I want you to remember, regardless of what's happening, I don't care what's happening, regardless of what's happening, you must take your stand with truth and righteousness. That is where people say, I don't know what hill I want to die on. That's the hill. I will not give way to those things. 
I will stand in truth and righteousness. And friends, I'll do it even when it's clear I'm going to lose the battle. Think about that. Will you pick a fight you know you can't win? If that's the fight and I know I can't win, I'll still pick it. Uh, that is the hill. Now, if you skipped ahead to the back of the Bible, you, you read through Revelation, and you know how things end. And you know this, there are certain battles that Christians are not going to win. Now, ultimately we do win, but there's periods of time in there where it really seems like the Christians are losing. It seems like they're pretty desperate and ugly and hard times. But we win in the end. Friends, we don't walk by what we see. I don't walk by what I see. I stand my ground and I take that stand with God and with righteousness. In Ezekiel chapter 8, uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting passage. I don't have anywhere near the time to go through it. You can look it up when you have a minute. God is going to take the prophet Ezekiel to his temple. And he's going to show Ezekiel what's happening in the temple behind closed doors. Wicked and detestable things are happening in his temple. And God tells Ezekiel, he said, you think that's bad? There's even worse stuff going on. And he shows him that as well. He says, these people have filled the land with violence. They think I don't see. They think I don't know what's going on. I will judge them in my anger. And then you flip the page into chapter 9. I'm going to begin in verse 1. This is the prophet speaking. He said, and then I heard God call out in a loud voice, bring near those who are appointed to execute judgment on the city each with a weapon in his hand. And I saw six men coming from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. With them was a man clothed in linen who had a writing kit at his side. They came in and stood behind the, beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of God went up from above the cherubim where it had been, and it moved to the threshold of the temple. And when the Lord called to the man clothed in linen who had the writing kit at his side, he said to him, Go throughout the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament. And I would add, who are offended. Offended by these detestable things that are done in it. And as I listened, he said to the others, Now follow him through the city and kill without showing pity or compassion. Slaughter old men, young men, women, mothers, and children. But do not touch anyone who has the mark. Here's the the thing, guys. I can't change what this broken world is doing around me. I can't stop it. I don't approve of the things that they approve of. but I must be found taking my stand with righteousness and with holiness. That is appropriate for me. It's important that I, as a believer and a child of God, remain offended by the things that offend him. I need to be offended by the grievous things done in our land. And it's right for me to be grieved. In fact, it's even more right for me to be found in prayer, standing against these things. Father, this is utterly detestable. Asking him to move, asking his kingdom to come and his will be done on earth. You need, just don't make any mistake, friends. Even at this very moment, even today, there is a man with a writing kit at his side and he is marking out those and he is taking note of those who are grieved and who are offended and who are lamenting what's happening in our land. I'm just telling you, you want to be counted among them. Number three, the last one. I want you to remember something. Regardless of how dark the hour looks, sometimes in the middle of the looting and the pillaging and and the fires, and it just the hour looks dark and, and hope seems to be hard to find. I want you to remember something. We don't fight alone. We never have. The Godhead has promised never to leave us. But there are others that fight alongside us as well. These are those God has sent to help us in our battle. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 says this, Are not all angels ministering spirits 
now listen, sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. That's you and me. We're here to inherit salvation. In this passage, the author is he's talking about the office that an angel holds. It's an office that is subordinate to Christ. Angels were created by Christ, by God. They're not superior to Him. He's the Creator. And the reason He created them, their purpose, at least in one part, their ministry, if you will, revolves around furthering the divine purposes of God in humanity. Amen. The divine purposes of God in salvation of men and women. Guys, that's what the battle's all about. This whole fight, all this ruckus, all the looting, all the pillaging, all the stuff going on is a battle for the souls of men and women. That's it. That's, that's the whole gig. It's not over gold or oil. It's not over land or property. It's over souls. Amen. The purpose of angels, in a nutshell, as it, as it reflects on us, is to minister to those of us who are to inherit salvation. They have come to help you. And isn't that what you see as you read through the Bible? Didn't Gabriel come to Mary to explain what God was about to do in her and through her? Wasn't he sent to Zechariah as well to explain what was about to happen? Wasn't an angel sent to Gideon to encourage him and get him ready for a battle? And, and what about Daniel? I mean, this old boy had multiple angels coming to him. To explain to him what was going on currently and what was about to come. And then, when we get to the book of Revelation, John is being directed by the angels, again ministering to him, showing him what's about to come. Angels are ministering spirits and they are sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 28 holds the account of the prophet Elisha. And it's the account of when he takes an entire army captive. One dude took an entire army captive. In those days, Aram, the king of Aram was at war with Israel, and, and Elisha was a thorn in his side. See, God was speaking to Elisha, and he kept telling Elisha, what, what, what the enemy was going to do. And then Elisha would go to the king of Israel and say, hey, this is what he's about to he'd be hiding here, he's going to be over here. And, and, and the king of Aram is just about to blow a gasket because he's like, I, I, I can't do anything without this Elisha fellow knowing out. And so he decides that Elisha needs to be removed from the picture. And so Elisha is in the city of Dothan, and the king of Aram thinks, this is it. This is, this is my opportunity. I'm going to send my entire army, this big army. I'm going to send them down. We're going to surround the entire city. And that old boy is going to be in my house tonight. Well, early the next morning, Elisha's servant wakes up and he goes outside and he sees. I mean, guys, this ain't good. I mean, there's only two of us and... And he's the boss, and, and we're surrounded, and this isn't good. And he, he, he goes in, and he tells Elijah, we're, we're completely surrounded. I mean, the dude's in panic, right? He's freaked out. Goes to Elisha, alas, my master, what shall we do? Verse 16, don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and opened his eyes, uh, Pardon me, Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. And then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked, and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah, Elisha. Okay, so what's going to happen now is Elisha's going to pray again. He's going to ask the Lord to strike the entire army with blindness. And then they can't see. And then he goes to him and says, oh, yeah, you're in the wrong place. Dude, come with me. I will show you the place you need. And he leads the entire army away, captive. Just him and his servant. Guys, regardless of what comes, it doesn't matter what comes. It doesn't matter if your city is completely surrounded by the enemy. Don't be afraid. Even now, those who are with us 
are more than those who stand against us. They're far more. True, yes, stuff has been stolen. There's been looting, there's been pillaging, there's stuff burning all over the place. It's okay. Seems like in our country things have just gone clean off the rails. It's okay too. Because we're not the victims in this almost implausible story of human history. We're not the victims. The problem is the enemy has confused us with the victims. That's, that's actually what happened at, at, uh, uh, when, when David, uh, why can't you think of the name of the town? Ziklag, thank you. I can't think of the name of the town. It, just, it was gone. See, at Ziklag, what happened was the enemy had confused David with a victim. They thought, we're going to take everything he has. That was a mistake. In fact, it wasn't just a minor mistake. It was a massive oversight. David was not a victim. David was more than a conqueror. See, when they came, they didn't understand that they would not only take on David and David's army, but they were also going to take on the Lord with his angel armies. This is a big deal. This is like you're outmanned, outclassed, outgunned. You should just go home. I want you to understand something, friends. We are the called and we are the elect of the Lord. And if you want to take me on, well, you take on my family, but you also take on my God. Friends, whatever circumstances you find in your life today, maybe things aren't going the way you'd hope. Just remember, we don't walk by faith, by sight. We walk by faith. We take our stand with the truth and we remember that God is able to dispatch his angels as necessary. We are not the victims in this story. We are the victors in this story. It's like King David. We, we aren't just warriors or conquerors. We're so much more than that. See, when a warrior, when a warrior, nobody goes to war thinking that they are definitely coming home. Everybody who goes to war understands there's a chance I could die here. They all, that's why nobody wants to go to war. Conquerors, when they go to conquer, they understand there could be somebody greater than me show up later. I may conquer land, but they may conquer me and take what I have taken. Guys, we are more than that. We're more than conquerors in Christ. You can't die. I don't know if you understand that yet. Your body will die. It isn't going to make it anyway. But your spirit's eternal. Your enemy can't take you out, is what I'm trying to tell you. And what you have gained, what you have conquered, can never be taken from you. It can't be taken from you. You are more than conquerors. Paul's words were apt, they were accurate, and they were good. You are more than conquerors. Friends, the God of the angelic armies is with you. No weapon formed against you will prosper. That's his word. Yes, you might see some troubles. Yes, there's going to be some resistance. There might be looting, pillaging, and fires. It doesn't matter. No weapon formed against you will prosper. Lord Jesus, I bless your people today and I pray that you would encourage us and strengthen us. I pray, Father, you would help us to recognize the truth of the situation that we're in. I pray, Father, you'd help us to understand that we are the odds-on favorite to win it all. I pray, Father, you'd help us understand who we are in Christ and that we haven't come to this hour to lose or to run or to fail to finish. We've come to take the victor's crown. I pray, Father, that you would help us rise up in the strength that is in Christ. I pray, Father, you'd give us a glimpse of who we really are. I pray, Father, you would help us to lay hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What you hold in your hands, 
which you have are symbols of a covenant that you have made with the creator of the heavens and earth. It's a symbol of a promise that he made to you and a promise you've made to him. That's why we don't take it lightly. As we take these elements, we need to remember our covenant with him. His portion of the covenant cost him everything. It came at the price of his son. Our portion comes with a price too. It's our very hearts, our lives. And the night that one of his friends betrayed him, Jesus would take the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Let's receive it together. And after the meal was over, he took the cup and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. Let's receive it together. Thank you, Jesus. Friends, it's my prayer that you will catch a glimpse of who you are in Christ. It's my prayer that you will catch a glimpse of your power and your authority. It's my prayer that you would begin to understand how much terror you incite in your enemy, how fearful he is of you, how jealous he is of your covenant. I pray we will learn to walk as the victors that we are. Father, now I bless your people in Jesus' name. Father, I pray that your life would be on them. I pray, Father, that your word would be in their mouth. I pray, Father, their mouths would be a gospel horn and the signs and the wonders spoken of in your word would follow them according to that word. I pray, Father, that you would go before them and you would pave the way for them. And I pray, Father, that where the enemy causes them trouble this day, he would be bound and cast aside in Jesus' name. Amen.